Good morning, I'm Teresa Clark, and I'm the chairman and the executive editor of Africa.com. Thank you for joining us today for this conversation on tax in motion. We have an excellent panel of academics, policymakers, and in particular, a minister from Zambia who's going to provide us with some very useful insights as we tackle this very complicated question that we're facing at the beginning of 2024. As global and national debt grow, adequate tax systems are essential to support public goods and ensure that governments can run effectively, as the minister would know. However, there are massive divergences between tax regimes, profit shifting across jurisdictions, and new economic and technological models that make existing methods of calculation irrelevant. How can current efforts to reform the tax code be put into action? And what innovations are there to ensure that it's fit for the future? This session will be 45 minutes, and we will take time for questions at the end, so if you have any questions, please prepare to, to ask them. Let's provide a little bit more context before we get into the conversation with our group of experts here. Against the backdrop of growing global inequities, rising public debt levels, and multinational profit shifting, taxation is undergoing a significant transformation. Global public debt reached an all-time high of 92 trillion in 2022, which is a five-fold surge from 2000, and the most in almost six decades. Rising inequalities are straining the systems with concerning spikes over the last five years. Multinational enterprises continue to leverage a disparate global tax landscape with the OECD estimating annual losses of countries between 100 and 240 billion USD. The confluence of factors has led to increased pressure on governments to increase tax revenues and reform tax codes. Countries continue to innovate at the national level and are increasingly adopting digital technologies in order to improve tax administration. And at the same time, momentum for tax reform at the global level is gathering along differing lines of thought. With the 2021 OECD G20 inclusive framework on base erosion and profit shifting, and the recently adopted UN resolution on international tax cooperation at the UN, two visions to reshape the future of global taxation are on the table today. So with global consensus for change, what new solutions are needed to make fiscal fit for purpose, and where are the global tax system heading? So today, to tackle this issue, we have four experts, as I've already mentioned. I will start immediately to my left with Minister Situmbeko Masukutwane, who is the Minister of Finance and National Planning of Zambia. Thank you very much for being with us. We have Alison Schrager, who is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute for Policy Research in the US. Thank you, Alison. Lucas Chancel, who's an associate professor at Sciences Po in France and also a visiting professor at the Kennedy School at Harvard and Amitabh Bahar, who's the Executive Director at Interim at Oxfam International in Kenya. Thank you all for joining us. Um, let me start with you. Can I start with you, Chancel? Can I ask you a question? How can we ensure that tax systems are equitable and capable of supporting public goods in the face of growing global and national debt? Well, thank you for the invitation. Um, I think we, uh, maybe the starting point of this conversation is uh, realizing the um, growing uh, public spending and public investment needs in the coming decades. So uh, climate change is going to require a significant increase in investments from all actors, but the public sector will have to um, massively invest in solutions and also in compensation of potential losers. And this is going to further increase the needs for public resources. And so governments might want to choose to you know, increase debt levels. That might be one solution. That might be partly what some governments might choose to do. But surely not everything will be uh, financed through debt, especially given the context that you've just highlighted. And so uh, taxes, uh, from my perspective, will have to be increased in order to finance the, these new needs. And then the question is, how do we increase these taxes in a way that is fair, in a way that is equitable, in a way that um, small and medium businesses do not feel that, again, they will pay higher tax rates than the large businesses? 
And in the way that uh, the working and the middle classes in many countries do not feel that they also pay higher tax rates than uh, very wealthy individuals, because this is effectively what has happened over the past 40 years. The big actors, large multinational companies, um, and centimillionaires have been paying lower tax rates as a share of their revenues than the rest of the population. And you know, the theme of this uh, uh, event is, uh, of this Davos conference is rebuilding trust. And clearly this uh, definitely undermines trust in proportions that are even hard to image in. And what also undermines trust, I feel, is when we say, when the global committee says, uh, okay, we've, we've cracked this, we've solved this, with this 15% uh, multinational minimum corporate tax rate signed in 2021, we've solved the problem. Actually, we're very far from having solved the problem of tax justice in this world. For one thing, the 15% minimum tax, in fact, uh, is still much lower than what small and medium businesses pay in most countries in this world. Now, one solution would be say, okay, let's reduce the 15%, uh, the tax rate for small and medium businesses to 15% so that everybody pays the same. But then where do you get your resources to invest in public goods? So we really need to fix this, um, loop, these loopholes at the top of the tax system. It's always better when we do this collectively with 140 countries. But I really think that we, do, we should not, countries should not wait for 140 countries agreement to move forward. And we've seen that some countries have been front runners here. The US, for instance, when they asked for uh, automatic exchange of bank information, that's a way to close some of the loopholes to ensure that people pay their taxes. Some countries have implemented wealth taxes on the very wealthy, some European countries. I think that's a way forward. And I think that's where countries need to continue going. Otherwise, trust will not be there and resources will not be there to invest in climate change and all the, these other challenges. Thank you very much. These are good opening remarks to frame this conversation. Minister, may I turn to you? You're sitting in a position where you have to make these decisions and they're real people who depend on the policies that you put in place. Mm -hmm. Can you share with us your view on this and especially over the last few years in Southern Africa? Yes, thank you very much. Let me start by saying that um, that true broad themes that shape our thinking as we push on with the matters regarding taxation. Firstly, it is indeed true that there are elements within our societies that do not pay their full share of tax because they just choose to uh, willfully avoid uh, the taxes. As you know, uh, Zambia is a mining company, sorry, mining country, and uh, one of the things that we've noticed is that there are a number of, especially the small, small mining companies, the small mining companies all over the place, and uh, their contribution to the tax net is, uh, we estimate that to be uh, limited. So we are addressing this, riding on technology, um, applying the latest uh, technology, borrowing from what others have done. This is going to be one of our key objectives starting in 2024, how to bring these people into the tax net because they must pay taxes. So that is something that we are running with. Second issue that we are running with. Let's not forget that uh, a country such as Zambia, and I suspect many other African countries, including South Africa, our biggest problem right now is unemployment, youth unemployment. We are seeing engineers graduating economists, lawyers, and so forth, they have no jobs. And because they have no jobs, they cannot pay taxes. So our responsibility is to create jobs so that we have decent human beings that we can decently provide for in our countries. 
But of course, as we provide jobs, they also pay taxes. So for us, apart from focusing on those who are dodging from taxes, we see tax as a very important instrument to create jobs. Now, in the past, I think sometimes there's been a tendency to think that we can grow ourselves out of poverty by imposing tax rates that are well beyond those that comparable countries would be imposing. And this is very common in the mining sector, for example, in the case of Zambia and many other countries. You impose very high rates, thinking that you solve your problems of debt, you solve your problems of how to build infrastructure. What do you see? The end result is that the investment that must come in to exploit the natural resources and do other things, that investment declines. To give you a specific example, in the case of Zambia, between 2010 and now, between 2010 and now, while no single mine was opened in Zambia, copper mine, in fact, they were closing, across the border in DRC, new mines were opening. So today, DRC produces more than 2 million tons of copper. 10 years ago, they were only doing 400,000. 400,000 tons. Today, they are producing more than 2 million tons. Where Zambia is still stuck at the level where it was. What has been the problem? The tax regime in Zambia was way out of line. Our detractors will say, you are giving incentives. We are not giving incentives. We are just realigning our taxes to what other mining countries are taxing, because ours was way too out and we've paid the uh, penalty for that. Instead of investment coming to Zambia, investment went across uh, the border. So therefore, to be able to collect more taxes, the first instance is to realign these taxes to what others are doing, attract investment, produce more, and with more production, more taxes will be paid, more people will be employed to pay the taxes. So for us, that is now the theme of how can we also use tax as an instrument for raising investment. And uh, I think the opportunity is great for us because the minerals that we have are the minerals that the world is looking for in terms of greening the world economy. The copper, the cobalt, the manganese, the nickel, so this is the time now to realign the taxes with what everybody else does so that we take advantage of, the, take advantage of this special window that has opened to produce more, create more jobs, and to raise taxes for infrastructure. Thank you <coughs> very much for helping us to appreciate the real world implications. <coughs> we'll come back to the um, policy people and Alison. Can you help us think a little bit about how, as the world tries to do this harmonizing of tax rates around the world, what are some of the challenges in the, in the different jurisdictions? Well, I mean, certainly for the, say, there's different pillars uh, going forward, at least that the OECD put out, and the first one is um, increasing taxes on large multinationals. So not only taxing them in the country where they're domain, but also where they're doing sales. And, you know, potentially that could be, a, you know, a good way to raise revenue. And, um, but I, th I think we're already seeing a reluctance, certainly in the U.S., to pass that. Um, so you do have to contend with, um, well, you know, individual governments and, um, uh, sort of getting aligned on this. And I think that's also becoming a bigger challenge because it's, I mean, it's a very complex plan and it certainly is causing a lot of uncertainty. And I, th I think that's something we, we want to be mindful of because when we're talking about equity, there, there's two things we want to think about. We want to think about equity within countries, but we also need to think about equity globally. And um, I was reading your report, as I do every year, and I was just so struck by, um, you know, the inequality 
between different countries. And so much of getting around that is going to be encouraging investment all around the world, particularly in um, developing and lower income countries. So when you're harmonizing, you know, you as well, you know, you, you don't want to create tax havens, but you also want to maintain a level of certainty and transparency so you can c encourage more foreign direct investment because that is probably the best way to sort of share global wealth. Great. Well, Amitabh, Allison has referenced your report. Do you want to share with us a little bit about the conclusions? Sure. So uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, but, but let me start by a couple of uh, framing points. Musk, as we know, is one of the richest uh, men in history. He pays a true uh, tax rate of 3.3%. We as Oxfam work in Uganda with a trader, her name is Christine, and she pays 40%. Something is completely broken in the tax structure that we have. And this is happening in the context, and, and thank you, Alison, for the referencing our report. Since 2020, the billionaires have doubled their wealth. The top five have doubled their wealth, and this is the time when five billion people have collectively become poorer. Since 2020, billionaires have added three trillion dollars to their wealth. And this is happening at a time when 800 million people sleep hungry. In India, the country where I come from, in December, and, and everybody is celebrating the economic success story of India, but in December, India said that they needed to give uh, food doles to 800 million people. So that's the context we are living in. And, and there are solutions. One of them is to clearly tax the rich, the super rich, both in terms of income and wealth. And I think it's also extremely critical. Uh, our report this year is particularly shining a light on how we are entering an era of billionaire supremacy, where you have enormous power in corporations, which are essentially run by a few billionaires. So you, if you look at just the tax rates, as in since the 80s in OECD countries, we have half the tax rates now. And you're looking at countries starving one after another for resources to invest in fundamental services like education, health, drinking water. Sometimes I feel maybe we are, are we far removed sitting at WEF. The countries that I go, I actually see hunger. You do not get safe drinking water. And we are talking about more and more profits for these big corporations. So, so there's, there's something fundamentally wrong and then that needs to be fixed. So I would say really, as in if it's about rebuilding trust, it's about rebuilding trust with the social contract we have. And these large corporations are eroding trust. And, and that's a massive threat also to democracy. So I would really, you know, it should be an urgent wake up call for all of us. If we don't invert this conversation, I, I worry that we are uh, certainly heading towards extremely turbulent times. So let me just ask you a follow-up question. Um, in the opening remarks, and others have mentioned some of the global tax reform e efforts that are underway, do you think that they go far enough in addressing the issues of inequality that you're talking about? So as we, we do have the possibility of inequality-busting tax policies. We are happy that uh, President Lula, uh, via G20, is now bringing tax as a fundamental oh. work stream. We're happy to see countries like, whether it's Colombia, Spain, to start talking about wealth taxation. So there, there are some efforts happening. But if you ask me, are we going far enough? No. As in there's much more that needs to be done. And that's where I think this growing inequality needs to be brought in. It's, it's not a small fraction of the gap that we are looking at. We're going to completely miss the 1.5 uh, target. And if you look at the enormity of what climate change is doing, as you look at East Africa, five years of drought and sudden floods, which means massive disruption in the agriculture season. Uh, more than four million people have been displaced. Where do you get these resources? 
Good we talk of uh, loss and damage fund, but the commitments are so small. Where will we get all these resources from? If you don't tax the super rich, the super wealthy, and, and from our report, let me just quote one more figure because I think that's, that's startling. We are living in an era of, of cost of living crisis, and it's the same time when the top 100 corporations have paid 80% of their profits to their shareholders. What about this whole conversation in WEF about stakeholder capitalism? What happens to the supply chain? <coughs> what happens to the place, the agriculture worker, from where you procure your uh, raw material? So there are several questions that need to be asked. There is a fundamental need for, for re-looking at the question of inequality. Minister, let me come back to you for a moment. Um, in your opening remarks, you spoke a lot about your domestic policies and some of the stakeholders internally to Zambia that may not be bearing their fair portion. When we talk about the global efforts, how do any of these global efforts at harmonizing impact a country like Zambia? Will this be a benefit to Zambia? Well, um, I think from the global efforts, as far as we can tell, the key benefit that we can derive out of that is um, sharing of knowledge uh, and skills. I spoke earlier on what is being done to draw, <clears throat> to draw in those um, mining companies, small mining companies, that are not contributing to the tax net in a fair manner. And uh, we think that we are benefiting a lot from what is being done in the world. The technology that is being developed, um, and I must say that the technology that we are deploying now is technology that we have uh, borrowed from one of the neighboring countries that are far ahead of us in terms of uh, uh, technology. So to the extent that uh, new tools and uh, techniques are being developed, it is something that uh, is of benefit to us. I would also want to say that uh, there is effort that is going on now to share information across the world on taxpayers, whereby tax authorities are able to exchange information about uh, I think you called it shifting of profits and stuff like that. We encourage those kind of uh, uh, efforts to continue because uh, we are good consumers. I mean, we can uh, benefit a lot from uh, uh, these developments uh, that are taking place. Good. I also want to say finally that uh, um, we are always talking to each other and uh, even at policy level, to be able to learn from colleagues what is it that works and uh, what is it that doesn't work. And uh, one of the conclusions that we've drawn is the thinking that a country will become rich, a citizen becomes rich by imposing super heavy taxes out of line with what others are doing. Uh, for us, that is a lesson that says don't, don't go in that direction. Uh, finds a middle of the way that attracts investments, creates wealth, more jobs, more taxation. So I would say that these are some of the elements through which we are learning from our interactions with the rest of the world. So, Lucas, you hear what the ministers had to say about needing to be competitive relative to other jurisdictions. Can you comment from your perspective on what some of the challenges are to harmonizing the tax regimes across different jurisdictions? Maybe starting by saying that um, uh, over the past 40 years, there has often been this implicit assumption that uh, tax evasion, whether legal or not, was something that countries couldn't really do something about. That uh, tax evasion was, you know, it, it was there. It had to be taken uh, for, uh, for granted. But the truth is that this is not a law of nature. You know, tax evasion is not something that uh, uh, is imposed on us like, uh, like gravity. It's, it's something that governments can actually uh, act against. 
Um, so it's always better when, when we get together as a global community and we discuss about what should be the actual tax rate and the set of rules that are going to go with it. Um, and that's the ideal way to do it. But even um, as um, uh, a set of countries or even a single country who would like to uh, move forward on, on these uh, issues, uh, there are options. So there are things like exit taxes, for instance, you know, when uh, very wealthy individuals decide that, okay, I don't, do not want to pay taxes in this country anymore, so I don't want to be a resident of this country anymore, I'm going out. Well, some countries have exit taxes to try to compensate for the fact that these persons created a lot of wealth, uh, probably because they were very clever individuals, probably also because the government was providing them with a set of infrastructures, of public services, of education systems, of cultural systems, whatever, that made them uh, be able to uh, enrich themselves. So exit taxes is really something that countries can do. And of course, it's always better than countries uh, harmonize all that. But that's my first point. Tax evasion, whether legal or not, is not a law of nature. And there are many things that governments can do in order to act, to get, to act against it. Maybe the second point here is that when we look at how the negotiations on the 15% global minimum corporate income tax rate were uh, carried out, I feel that, um, I at least I observe that a lot of um, low-income and middle-income countries were upset about how the negotiation process happened. And it is true that this was a negotiation process that was under the aegis of the OECD, giving a lot of uh, uh, power in these negotiations to rich countries, to rich nations. And so uh, when we're discussing about maybe augmenting this process or reopening it to go further, I, think, I feel it's very important to think about the right setup. And to me, the ideal setup here is the United Nations. It's not a club of rich countries that are benevolent enough to incorporate uh, other countries. No, it should be, you know, every country has an equal voice here. And I welcome the proposal by, you know, the, uh, the Global South led by Brazil in the G20, but we really need to, here to incorporate all countries in a, in a framework like under the UN Tax Convention. Uh, that has been pushing these, these subjects over the past uh, years and that have actually come up with proposals that are more favorable to low and middle income countries than what was actually uh, adopted at the OECD. Maybe a final point of this. Um, so to me there are things that have worked over the past uh, few years in terms of uh, tax negotiations things that have started but that are still very limited in what they were able to actually achieve, and topics that actually are entirely missing from the agenda. Things that work is automatic exchange of bank information. That is something that is very positive and it, it worked. What has started to be discussed is global minimum corporate taxation. But 15%, as I said, is too low, and there are so many loopholes that corporations continue to pay very uh, low tax rates, 5 10%, lower than 15 And something that hasn't been addressed at all is the taxation of centimillionaires or billionaires. And so far, we do not have a framework to discuss that and to make progress on this. And this is where I would like to see a lot of progress in the coming months and years. That's great. In just a moment, I'm going to open it up to questions, so if you have any, start getting them ready. But let me ask a question now um, to, to Alison and to Amida. Um, as we've just talked about some of the more innovative ideas mm -hmm. to address this. Um, can you share with us any ideas that you've come across in your, in your research um, that you think are innovative that can address the challenges that we're talking about? Um. Well, I mean, I think what we want to do, I mean, we do really need to rethink a lot of global tax, clearly. I mean, really just because we have a more an economy more based on intangibles. We have a lot more globalization. So I, I but um, really, I mean, it depends on the country. I focus more on the U.S. And I mean, my preferred way of taxing the U.S. isn't exactly, I don't know, innovative. I think we should move more towards consumption taxes um, and away from corporate taxes. Um, you know, obviously we need corporate taxes, but um, the problem with corporate taxes and using those as your main means of uh, 
raising tax revenue is often the person who ends up paying for them, that that burden is borne by the workers. And if we want to be equitable, I mean, that is often, you know, not the people we want to target, which is why, you know, the way I was always, you know, taught public finance is it's better to sort of tax consumption, particularly high-end consumption. That way you can be more targeted and get the wealthy because, you know, as much as we would like to get more revenue from the super wealthy and they certainly can afford to pay a lot more, it's very t challenging to tax their wealth because wealth is very hard to measure. Uh, a lot of their assets are in um, private entities that are really impossible to value. So um, I think we should be thinking a lot more about, um, say, VAT taxes and a lot of um, aspects of technology is making that a lot easier because you can sort of see at all different chains of the sort of um, production process where value is being created. So it makes sort of instituting those VATs a lot easier because, you know, we might want higher than a 15% um, tax on corporations, but politically it's a very hard thing when you have a lot of countries that have sort of built their economies around being a low-tax state. So getting them to agree to it, as I said, the U.S. is already sort of very reluctant to pass this first pillar just because it would largely hit their big tech firms. And sort of they see that as, it's debatable, but some politicians definitely see that as undermining their tax revenue and their base. So that's what makes sort of even something as simple as that, which isn't even the 15% minimum tax, just a relatively easier part, already very hard to pass. So we have to be realistic about, you know, what's possible. Uh, think very carefully about tax incidents and who that fits and um, what's politically feasible. Amitav, do you agree on consumption tax? You know, I, I, I would just coming back to your question, I would say that um, why do we run after innovation when the fundamentals are broken? I think it's, it's really critical. We, we know progressive taxation works. And that's something that we are running away from. In the last one decade, corporate taxes have come down 10%. Income taxes have gone up uh, by 20%. Consumption taxes have gone up by 10%. What are we trying to do? We're ending up actually taxing the workers and common citizens. Whereas on the other hand, the super rich continue to go scot-free. So it's just going back to the fundamentals of progressive taxation, and that's something uh, that we certainly need to do. And then on, on the question of the corporate taxes, as in the enormity of the power they have, as in, again, I would urge everybody to have a look at our report. We're essentially making that point that these corporate monopolies now have so much power that they're able to even change policies and the economic systems. And that's extremely worrying for any democratic society. Yes, I see you have something you want to say. Lucas, go ahead. Very quick response to the argument that it's actually too complicated to tax wealth, though we should tax consumption. I didn't say complicated. Difficult, Is it complicated, yeah. hard to measure. Well, there are a lot of businesses in this uh, world that uh, actually their daily business is about estimating the value of other businesses. So if we're not able to measure the wealth of businesses and of individuals in this um, data-intensive world, there is some kind of an issue. And the other argument here is, you know, in 1913 and 14, when uh, income progressive taxation was invented, the very argument of those who were against that was to say, we do not have the data. We don't know how, how much people earn. And that was the, correct at the time. Governments didn't have this statistical toolkit to, to know how much people were earning. They created this uh, uh, statistical apparatus to implement these taxes. So to me, this is really the kind of uh, leap that we need and that we can do today. Because if we start to tax consumption, as was just said before, this is really the very things that, from my perspective, contributes to undermine trust. Because taxes on consumption, we know, are very often in fact, in fact, in so many cases, very regressive. That is, they fall much more on those who have the least resources and the very wealthy are able to, uh, you know, uh, have a very small tax burden when uh, we have a tax system that relies essentially on consumption taxes. Minister, do you want to get in on this conversation about consumption taxes? Well. Um, I do understand this debate, especially from uh, countries where we have a lot of people who are wealthy. Um, 
and of course many other people who are consumers. But when you've got few of those, because if you look at um, the case of Zambia, the number of corporates, uh, corporate bodies that are really viable and uh, contributing positively, there are very few. Okay, so the end result is that uh, people who are in formal employment and therefore are unable to pay taxes, and also people who are in the formal business themselves and who get captured in tax net, there are very few. So our challenge is to increase the number of uh, corporates or companies, whether they are big, whether they are small. Um, our challenge is to increase the number of investment, more companies, more individuals in employment. Um, if we are just going to insist on, say, the few that are there, the few businesses that are there, tax them and think that we are now going to uh, create more money for the state, you are shooting yourself in the foot. If you are going to say the few of you who are in employment, formal sector employment, we tax you more and more, and we think that we are going to add value to the economy, you'll be shooting yourself in the foot. So I think for us, our challenge is how can we raise the level of economic participation um, by entities that are economically viable? And um, we can only do so by avoiding the risks of overtaxation. I'm not saying no tax, everyone must pay their taxes. But the temptation in the third world is to believe that uh, if you tax higher than what other people are taxing, then you are making progress. You are not making progress. You are delaying progress. Do we have questions here? Yes? Do you think someone's going to bring you a microphone? Thank you. I'm Salma Melissa Mohamedian from Global Shapers Morelia, which is in Mexico. I have a lot of questions, but I will ask just one. <laughs> I'm starting my master in international taxes. So for me, it's very important to share this and ask. Um, for me, it's not about uh, wealth taxes. I think that's a solution to a problem that has been going on to a couple of years ago, but it's not a future um, thing that should happen. Because for me, it's more about the income taxes hasn't been able to achieve the percent that they need to contribute for companies uh, because there is a lot of loop loopholes in the taxes or our law institutions and we also are not talking about the um, informal economies that we have in our all of our countries of course everyone should pay taxes but not everyone is paying them and also the ones that are paying it it's just the it's up for them the rate but not for the ones that are not paying taxes. So for me, the question will be, how can we make or some strategies for the informal economies to actually pay taxes instead of just looking okay. for the ones that are paying and up the rates for them? That will be my question. Informal economy, who wants to tackle that one? Um, I, I could say a few things, I don't know that much about it, but um, it does seem that, you know, there's just the m more um, sort of digitization of money is really opening up a lot of new doors for that. Um, and as I said, as more people like sort of are, you know, are paid electronically, then that's information. Because I mean, right now, if you're being paid cash, there's really no way to know in the informal economy who's getting paid what. So um, I think that, I mean, it's slow. I mean, this is also sort of often, you know, the, the a population that you know is still getting using cash more, but certainly it's also a population that's using a lot doing of transactions also on phones more. So I think I mean there's been some case studies in, in the African continent about different ways you can start collecting tax revenue from that population. You know, obviously at an appropriate rate. Maybe I can just add on that uh, from what we have seen in our country in Zambia. Um, you are right. There's a a lot of tax avoidance from actors in the informal sector. So 
um, one of the things that we've had for some time is to create a threshold that if you are a small and medium, especially the very small one, micro, because those are the ones uh, that tend to avoid taxes a lot, at that level, uh, we have attempted to put a threshold and say if your revenue per year is so much, uh, we will not go after you with formal books and uh, accountants and so forth. We just agree that uh, X percent of your revenues you must pay uh, in taxes. But I think she, she also mentioned, I think the era of digitization is creating new opportunities of how we can uh, make people to contribute. And one of the things that we did in the budget pronouncement for this year, 2024, is that money transfers via mobile phones, because that is now a lot of transactions are taking place in, in Africa, not via banks, but via mobile phone transfers. And uh, to the extent that a number of the informal sector business players transact a lot on the mobile phones, we've imposed a small tax on the transfers themselves. Of course, we are also mindful of the fact that we should not kill this initiative. It's good that people who are in the informal sector have now been included in the financial sector via mobile phones, so we don't want to come with a big hammer to kill that prematurely. But at the same time, we have believed that uh, this, these transactions reflect a certain degree of ability to pay, and therefore we will impose taxes. There is much more to be learned, and uh, as this digitization comes on stream and uh, progresses, I'm sure I will learn more lessons on what else we can do to make them contribute. I mean, Tab, do you have something that you want to say on this topic? Yeah, so I know we are running out of time, so I'll, I'll just make three telegraphic points. Uh, the first, um, I think we need to also get into the fundamental question of why do we have the informal sector? And what does the informal sector essentially means? At least in India, it essentially means no job security, no social security, and therefore, again, the argument of we need much greater progressive taxation to ensure that the state is able to deliver the fundamental task of ensuring dignity of work for everyone. So the, I think that would really be the fundamental point. Second, as in just because I, I, I get completely foxed by this argument that because there's poor tax compliance, Let's do away with taxes. As a leaking bucket, let's not uh, collect water. I, 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 you know, we need to ensure compliance. And that's, that's really uh, the critical piece. And the third, digital, you know, the, with technology, businesses are changing dramatically. Capital is able to move across borders so comfortably. And people at the moment just cannot. Or so many of people will not even get visas to come to this place. So, so there are those fundamental questions that we need to uh, address, particularly on the informal sector. And I feel very strongly if you work with the informal sector in India, they are just surviving. Whereas there's still a very large class of people who are thriving with excessive opulence. Well, I think that this has been a really dynamic conversation with many different perspectives shared. Let me try to summarize what I've heard in this conversation. Um, we know that the theme of this overall WEF is around um, rebuilding trust. And it was pointed out in the early part of this conversation that that certainly applies to tax policy. And that's a big part of what we're talking about here today is trust. Trust within nations, trust globally. Climate change is requiring um, an increased need for public resources, and so this is one of the very important things that's driving the need to think about tax policy. We went on to talk about the fact that small businesses seem to pay more in taxes than corporates, and we had many examples of that. 
and the minister helped us also to appreciate that within his country, um, that is certainly a challenge for the small businesses. We then went on to talk about how different countries um, need to be aligned globally and within a region. And if you don't do so, then from the perspective of any one nation, you might lose out um, to economic development that goes across borders. We went on to talk also about the fact that um, the Global South needs to have its voice in the tax policy and that many of the international um, policies that we've discussed that have been on the table have been driven by the Global North. And so then we had an interesting conversation about consumption tax versus income tax. We have different opinions, which always makes for a lively conversation. Um, and I think that at the end of the day, we had some closing remarks that looked a lot at the fact that why are we looking for innovation? Because there is a view that progressive taxing works, and it's just a question of enforcing that. We also heard from the minister that in his country, he's looking to use technology in order to do a better job in complying with the existing tax structures, and that compliance will help achieve some of these goals. So thank you all very much for your contributions to this conversation. And thank you for being a good audience. Thank, thank you. you.